Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Jens Heitland Show, where I interview experts from different fields to connect the dots of innovation and entrepreneurship. Today's guest is Assistant Professor Accounting, Methodist University in Fayetteville, North Carolina. He is five times TEDx speaker and author of a book. Please welcome to the show, Amphon Akpan. Hello, Amphon. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great, Jens. It's great to be here. Great to, great to have you. It's really lovely to, to have another professor, professor on the show. I've had already one or two even. Oh, <laughs> and, wow. That's and, awesome. And, and funnily enough, all from, from, from the US. No, no European yet. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> oh wow! Well, well, you got it. Next time, I got to come to Europe and then do the show. <laughs> I got to come to you know. Germany. We need to do that. We need to do that definitely. <laughs> so, be, be, before we look, of course, into education, but as well technology, um, social media, and innovation topics. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you? How how did you get to where you are today? Oh, wow. So that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, again, am Fan Akpan. I am a professor at Methodist University. And I got into academia in what they call the non-traditional route. So I did not go straight through school and, and get my PhD and then start teaching. So I worked in industry. So about nine years I spent in finance as well as teaching part-time, then I moved into teaching full-time in business school. And, uh, you know, so I wound up here in North Carolina as assistant professor of accounting. Huh. So I have, I've never thought about getting, getting into teaching and a professor. And we just chatted before that I'm right now establishing an online course, which feels like I'm a teacher as well. Um, so how, how did how did you get to to what, what was the step that get, got you into teaching? What was like kind of the epiphany for you? Put putting my foot in it and working as an adjunct and really being able to see, really being able to contribute and really see the impact that you were making uh, on people's lives, and that that's really just being able to give. Um, <laughs> I did not imagine myself, so, so just, you may not know that my dad was a professor. And, you know, he was even shocked that he was like, hey, you wanna go into, but after actually, and I actually being in the classroom and working with the students and seeing how you can help and the impact you can make, I was, I was hooked. That was, that was my turning point. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's always fascinating for me because I'm my whole life into business. I couldn't imagine me going into into school system, at least not the system where, where it is right now, but let's not touch that right now. <laughs> so, so looking into technology innovation, starting off with what, how do you see the future of education and specifically, of course, in your fields? Um, how is this evolving and how, how is it innovating over time? Oh, that's a good question. It's, well, technology. And technology is the key word. And as we are moving forward in time, technology is, is developing and it at a rapid pace. So a lot faster than really that we can keep up with. So what happens instead of a focus so much on hardware, software, and learning the technology, because if you think about, there was a period of time where you may use a certain software for seven, eight years or certain mm -hmm. you know, hardware, but now things are changing so fast, it's a focus on the skills that you need to navigate that software. So it's, it's, I see it more as a skills focus versus focusing in on the actual technology itself. The, the skills you need to focus on the technology and being a professor, we've got to think, really, we've got to try to look into the future because yeah. we've got students. If I've got a freshman in 2021, I'm trying to prepare that person for 2025 and beyond. And what will that world look like? 
you know, and if you think about it, especially with the pandemic, you think about what does the world look like from 2020 to 2021? They, things have totally changed. Yeah. You know, I, I've had students, I had students tell me, so in 2019, I used to have you Zoom to have guest speakers come into the classroom, right? The students have never seen Zoom. They've yeah. never seen it before. I had one student tell me, you know, they they thank actually she she thanked me because she was saying in our class I got to see Zoom. I was exposed to it, and but now we use it every day. You know, we have class it, but I'd never seen it, never heard of it. So this is this is how fast things change, and we really may not even feel it. You know, we feel it because we get so used to it. Yeah. How how is it from technology adoption as well with the students? I can't imagine. I mean, I was in school and and get, getting the education where there was even no smartphone. So how, how is that changing? How do you use different technologies? And I've I've listened to a TED talk of you where where you dig into into that topic. So how do you engage with your students using technology in these days? That's a good point. So exposure and and really, I think. Uh, many people assume the assumption is the students are experts in technology. Not, not necessarily true. <laughs> so he, 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 here's what, so you have to think from a professor, I'm expert in technology, but in productivity. Hmm. So if I, I'm using, you know, what is it? PowerPoint, Zoom, learning management systems. I know how to use all of that software. The students may be proficient in their phone, in particular, TikTok or Instagram or a particular social media. But outside of that, you tell them to get on and format something or go on Excel and do certain things. They may not know how to do it. Hmm. So we, we have those skills as well. So realizing that and then exposing the students to various technologies And again, helping them also to develop skills, focusing on the skills and not necessarily the technology itself, because things can change. Or they may have access to hardware or software that, you know, it, it may be outdated or, or changed in a, a, a few, you know, few months, few weeks. I, I'll tell you, so we were talking about stories. I'll tell you a story. Um, I have a buddy who works in industry. And um, he's a controller, you know, so he works in industry and he was talking about Tableau. Okay, great. I went, I learned Tableau, took a course, learned Tableau. I come back to him, we have lunch again, maybe about eight months later. I'm like, hey, you know, I took a Tableau course. I'm using Tableau, this is great. He's like, oh, we stopped using Tableau. We use Abacus, Tableau is too slow. And now we got it. He's like, I don't like Abacus because I have to program it. So I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> what just happened here? Right. So the, it, things just totally change. And right after that, I was at a conference and one of my colleagues uh, was talking about, well, I'll give it Kimberly Church. She was giving a presentation on this about how these things keep changing. You know, you've got Power BI, you've got Tableau, you've got Excel. And she was honing in on focusing on the students, learning how to program, focusing on the program, getting exposed to it. Not necessarily, it could be any type of language. And someone asked a question, well, hey, what if we don't have uh, the resources for certain software? Her reply, ha have them write formulas in Excel. So they start building the, the foundation, that, that skill, that thought pattern of programming. So they build it up. So if they're exposed to that, they move into another software where they do have to pro. it's not as hard. So you're helping them with those skills. So moving more into that, that skills-based uh, level. So do, do you then build first fundamental skills where where they get the understanding of how languages work in general from a technology perspective and then get them more advanced into it or how does that work i would say get them to 
as much exposure as you can. So to, to, to get back on that question, you got to think, I may be at a university that has a lot of resources. Hmm. So I can, I can dive deeper into something and expose students into something where someone else at another university, they may not have those resources and are able to do that. So what can you do or what can you use to at least expose them at some level? So to answer your question, yes, if you can, but if not, there's other items that, that you can use to do that. Um, another example uh, we, you know, we, we touched on earlier, virtual reality. Huge proponent of virtual reality. You know, I, I see it, it's, it's up there with, with AI, robotics. And many times we think about you know, the Oculus headsets, and we think about all of this very expensive hardware, but there's web VR, there's 360 videos. Hmm. So there's things, there's, there's lower levels of immersion, different varieties of VR or platforms that you can use to expose students to it so they see it, they understand how it works. And the other thing is, it's gonna change, we, you know, um, as I was mentioning mm. about my, my book, I wrote The Hitchhiker's Guide to Virtual Reality. I wrote that book. I finished the book, I want to say in 2019. It came out in 2020. And, it, and you look at it right now, majority of the things you use in the client, they're, I won't say they're obsolete. I won't say they're obsolete. I won't say that they're dated, but they're old. So a lot of the technology I'm talking about, and these are Oculus Go headsets, 360, it's, it's old yeah. because you've got Verbella frames, you've got Mozilla hubs, which can't, was, you know, was out last year. And then right a few months ago, you've got some spatial. And then there's other programs that you can use and they're all free. Yeah. You can yeah. access on your, all you need is the internet to access them. Um, so being able to expose them to these technologies, see how they work and how they can apply them, it helps because as they increase in usage or the students are in the workplace four or five years from now, they're not like, oh my God, what is that? I've never seen this before. What does it do? How does that work? They've already seen it in some shape or form and know how to use it. Yeah. And I think that's just dub doubling on, on that. I think that's an important perspective of, in the end, you're preparing the students for the business in the future where they contribute to society and so on, and they need to have fundamental skills. But I guess as well, how, how do you work with the part from a mind, mindset perspective? Because it's changing so fast and it's not, hey, I've learned this. And maybe it was like, 30 years ago, I've learned this and I can use that knowledge the next 20 years. It's like you, you, you learn something and you need to change it. Like, like you said, in a year after you need to adapt you, what you have learned and take it to the next level, take it to the next level. How do you prepare your students on that mindset part? Yeah, that it's, it's challenging. And a lot of it is <laughs> with the student, they may not see it initially It's more on the look back. But again, explaining that whole exposure and skills-based approach. I go back to that example, the student who thanked me for the Zoom. You know, and because I remember, and it was so funny because I remember that. And the student's like, why are we getting, why don't we have this thing up? What is that? What are you going to use it for? And you know, they saw it. And what she explained to me was it lowered, she was in a situation where she had an interview. And it was on Zoom. Mm. And just the fact that she'd been exposed to it and seen it and it, it, it used it a little bit, she knew what it was and that lowered that anxiety. And she was able to get right in there and she knew what, what was going on. So I think, I think that's one of the ways, that's why I focus so much on the skills because it, it, from an employee, so many employers, they want the, their, their new employees, they want these students to be up and running, you know, yeah. come on yeah. the workplace and, and, or to easily be able to understand. So you may not, you know, okay, fine. You may not know, uh, you've seen zoom, but you use Microsoft teams hmm. or another. So, so you know how it works. 
so you can get started with it. But if you haven't seen anything, then you're like, wait a minute. Or I have students using Verbella frames so they can see how this web VR works, how they can use it, they can communicate with each other, move around in there and work with it. Maybe they go in the workplace, they're using something spatial or another program. They have an idea, they can get up and running a lot faster. So I think, I think that that's the skills-based approach. I think uh, it is also, it, it also, it helps because we don't know what the future is going to be like. We don't yeah. know two years from now, what are we going to be using? Right now we're using Zoom. We can be using something totally different in two years from now. So yeah. how, how, do, how do you see technology evolving in, 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 in that field? In which, say it again. So how, how do you see technology evolving in, in, the, in the context of universities and how you use it going forward? Uh, definitely. Well, it's going to continue to develop and kind of match up with the work world or with industry because it's hand in hand because you got to, on our end, we've got to know what's going on on the outside so we can train the, the students as best as possible when they get out there into the, to the work world. So I think it's going to go hand in hand. Um, I think a lot more, you're going to see a lot of uh, connections and tie-ins to certain skills and, and um, getting the, the students up to speed to kind of jump into different roles, to jump yeah. into different roles. Yeah. Education. If we look forward into education, how do you, how do you see the education changing? If we, if we just zoom into, let's say, it's 2020, 2040. What, what, what do you see changing from an education perspective? Wow, you know that, that's, a, that's a, a big, big question. I, I would take it from my point, I would say in, um, from the accounting perspective, I did, you know, education, I'll break it from business yeah. to accounting, my field. I would say we're going to see a lot more data analytics. The profession I'm in is, is not going to be the, the same, uh, I guess, traditional mold that you would envision um, for that profession. A lot of data, a lot of working with um, software, AI, virtual reality, definitely. You'll see a lot of, of more of a technology emphasis again and from my perspective those skills so for example you you talk about uh, big data so you being being able to handle and manage large amounts of information that will be key having those skills and knowing what to do and how to utilize particular tools yeah so if if technology is evolving and and they're kind of the technology is giving us the data how, how do you see then from analyzing the data and getting the insights one thing is having the technology doing that for us but the other side is well understanding it and then using it in in the real world how, how do you how do you see that evolving or even even today in in the classes from a skills perspective how do you develop that skills for your students yeah a lot more project based um, experiential learning. So you have students working on projects, building up skills. Because you think about you work on a project, right? So you got to start and you got to finish it. And in between, you're, you're building your critical thinking, you're solving a problem, and you're understanding how to get started with it and how to approach it. And how that can transfer into industry or to the work world is that you build those critical thinking skills and overall skills to solve that problem and you can decide which tool to use. So that goes back to what we talk about with the hardware and software. Hmm. Once you know how to solve the problem, you can decide, you can use whatever tool you, you need to get it done, right? At that time, you may have to, so there may be a learning curve on that particular hardware software, but you know, I need this to get this done and to, to solve this problem. 
I would like to take a slight turn and put the attention towards you. So, I mean, I haven't been exposed to too many professors, um, but for me, what, what I found out in the research that you're a very innovative professor. Um, it's, it's, it's at least what I've seen. It's not usual that a professor has a, has a YouTube channel, has, uh, is, is active on all social media platforms on, and, and so on. How, how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as an, as an innovative professor or is it just normal in the world where you are in? I, I, I would say I don't see myself as being innovative. I, I see myself as seeking knowledge, seeking as much information as possible, always looking for better ways uh, of moving forward and really helping the students trying to see what's going to be in the, in the next four years or bring, bringing something that's, that's um, important into the classroom as, as, um, as, as I'm able to do, as I'm able to do. Uh, but I appreciate that. You know, but, you, but at the same time, you have to think about it. As a professor, it's kind of hard. It, 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 things go either way. Either I'm going to have the students come to me or I'm going to go to the students. Yeah. You know? And if the students are on YouTube, you know, it behooves me to be on YouTube. If they're on TikTok, you know what? Let, let me check out TikTok and see, what, see what's going on there to try to make that connection as quick if they're on their phones you know why push them to be on their laptop so to try to you know reach them as easily as possible so so when you have started that um if you if you still remember that that days how did your students react when when they've seen you on oh he's on social media oh he is there and and he's having a youtube channel how, how did the people react as well when you change jobs <laughs> well, I think many of the, so of the essence of it, so the S, I'll tell you, the essence with YouTube was efficiency. Mm. It was efficiency because I talked to students, I knew many of the students um, w would not necessarily use the methods of getting video in the learning management systems that we would use having the YouTube, they can get it on their phone easily. So it's e an easy way to get information for the students. So they saw it as helpful, um, especially working out problems. That was a, the, my biggest feedback that I got, which amazed me because there's other videos of you know the problems, but I would work out certain problems and the students, the feedback I would get would be the students, I can pause it, I can go back, I can look at it again, and I can kind of see, see what you're doing and go, you know, go through that problem. So that, that was very, very helpful um, in that sense. Um, but getting the feedback. So it, many times, a lot of positive feedback on the ease of use. The other thing that um, uh, I want to say that and I'm not the first one to do is Instagram. That, that's been a big help as well, um, using Instagram. Now I'm in TikTok, but using Instagram, the, the features on there are amazing because you can do a live broadcast. At this point, you can have like a Zoom. So I would, you know, and most of the students are on their phone. They get the notifications. Mm. If I go live, so I would usually I make a uh, Instagram account for the course. They follow it. If I go live, they get on there. I have a guest speaker broadcast. It can record. You save it. Students pop in and ask questions. I mean, and you know, but but the key is the convenience. The student said it's it's easier because many of them they don't check their email, hmm. their student email. But if I post something on Instagram, they get the notification on their phone. You know. If they want to, uh, let's say they have a problem with something, they want to do a video and send it a video message, they can do it easily. You know? I love so, that. You know, so convenience. That and it 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 might sound silly, but that's so twenty twenty one perspective. 
because if coming from the business side, there are a lot of dinosaur businesses. They're not on TikTok. They're not utilizing the engagement opportunity with their customers, clients, whatever they are serving. And you you do this naturally. Um, and even even saying that it's not really innovative for me, it's super innovative. I don't know anyone else from a from an educational standpoint who is doing things like that. Um, maybe some some special who are into like educating art students who are going in, into this directions um, like video and so on. But accounting is let let's say sorry to say it it's it's maybe not the most sexy topic to follow on 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 YouTube or on other platforms for students, I guess. So you adapting that technology and using it in in an engagement opportunity, uh, for me, it's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, you, you made a good point, Jens. When you, so if you think of it from a business perspective, you know, got you got to know your customer. Yeah. So so and that is the students got to know where they are at, what they're doing, um, and and understand what you know, connects with them and then trying different things. So a lot of it is, is some of the things haven't worked. So, you know, didn't or, or didn't work well in certain situations, but it's still trying different things, seeing how things work and how you can, can put it together. Um, good, good uh, friend of mine um, who has a business called uh, Boosted Stripes. Mm. So, he, he had told me this, um, because, and, and this was at the time where TikTok was kind of like everybody would laugh, you know, like, oh, TikTok is for little kids. Well, you know, he said, I'm going to try, you know, uh, connecting with influencers on TikTok, because at that time, it wasn't as huge as it is now. Mm. Influencers were not as costly. You know, it's like, well, you know, I can establish those relationships, try it, see how it works. And if it gets big, I've already got a, re a relationship with a uh, influencer, which I've got upside, right, in the future. If not, I haven't lost much because it doesn't cost me as much as YouTube or Instagram and this thing. But it worked out well. You just, you know, you try it, and you, you test it and see how it works. And, and I think that's, that's, that's the, the, the interesting point for me from an innovation perspective you 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 literally do prototypes you test and validate your assumptions and understanding of what's working for your customers or clients which are the students it's it, it's just fascinating from that perspective <laughs> yeah and you know what thinking about it to tie that in i guess into to business is frick is what they call friction hmm. You know, they talk about if you got to click a lot, people will go away. It's the same thing. So if you make things easy for students to access, to get into, or find those points, and, and that's from my experience, finding ways that are easy for them to connect, you know, instead of them having to log in to the learning management system to go to this, to go to that, okay, if, if I just follow this Instagram account, I can see it all there on my phone in two seconds. You know, so if, or, okay, instead of me having to go into my school email, send my professor, a message, I can just go on my phone and text him a message on Instagram and he'll get it right away. I'll get, and I'll know he read it, <laughs> you know, they know I saw it and everything. So, you know, you find where there's less uh, friction. The other thing I was thinking about when you were talking about with accounting and social media, a lot of this data comes from what social media. For data analytics, you know, I have students to look at on their accounts. You can see your your data, you know, with your dashboard, you know, where where your traffic's coming from, who's looking at it. So a lot of that data comes from that. So it it, it ties in as well. Yeah, and 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 the beauty of that is, in the end, it's about students have the opportunity to learn in either way. But if you tailor made it to, to them to access it easier and make it more comfortable for them, they will learn better, they will learn more, which means then for, for, from a society perspective, it's better for society if you do it like this. If you force them, hey, this is the learning management system, you need to log in and it doesn't work from the phone and all these old clunky things, which I'm, I, I, that's my world where I understand school and universities, um, it's just 20 times more efficient and it's better for our society. Yeah, yeah, it, ma it makes it easier. 
But on the flip side, so on the flip side with the, so that's, that's more on, on me going to the student, but again, I, you know, the, there's, I have to really plan out how I get the students to come for me. So for example, I use, well, I've been using Verbella for this VR, web VR uh, program. Yeah. Many of the students haven't seen it. So I have to think through ways I'm going to incorporate this into the classroom to kind of get them to come to me and to get exposed to it and use it. And I kind of just, you know, one, one little bite at a time, you know, mm -hmm. so, so they say you can't swallow a whole watermelon, but you can, you can eat a little, little bite at a time. And then again, into it, get the feedback, they get exposed to it. And then we, we move forward. So that's a different challenge. That's a different challenge. Yeah. Do you, do you see any big changes from a pandemic perspective um, from tech adoption with the students and how you engage with your students? Yeah, now we've got we've, we've got students who are used to Zoom. So so many students have been having classes, what they call virtually. Many of them have been exposed to totally uh, asynchronous or online courses. So, so there's more penetration in that way. More instructors, professors have been getting used to it and using the technology as well. How that will cross over and carry over moving forward is yet to, to be seen because you, you, you've started seeing these, they call it high flex, where you have students watching you on video, on Zoom, some students in the classroom, some students online. How that will evolve, I... I couldn't say. However, mm. what, what I have seen is, and, and I think will become of more importance, is Zoom etiquette and really understand how to, to, to use these platforms and develop, again, skills, professional skills, because many jobs, mm. instead of, hey, we're going to fly so-and-so out, no, we just get on a Zoom. And we meet. So, how do you use Zoom, the protocol, and interviewing? It's, it's going to another level as far as those skills, as well as meetings, because you may have people uh, working from home and having meetings uh, at home instead of going to the office. Yeah. You know? So, so you may see some of that. So, a lot of those skills. So, I yeah. think it will be tied in. Same with workshops, running running workshops where you normally put twenty people into one room. This is now working on Zoom and different other platforms at the same time, and people got used to it. And companies, like like you said, most probably will will do that more often because it's just cheaper than flying people around the planet. Yeah, it's mm. cheap. Save, save saves money. You know, is 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 a lot easier uh, to do, and can and you can connect with more people at once. Like you said, you're getting twenty people in a room. Now you have 300, 400 people, yeah. you know, yeah. in a room in other parts of the planet. We're in two, I'm in the in North Carolina, you're in Germany, you know, so it's, it, it can connect the, the world in a different way. Yeah. Um, so I think that's important and a new way to do business. And you got to think about it and you got to incorporate that, especially how, how that, that's got to be incorporated into education because you've got students who they may be working remotely. In yeah. these cool. I would like to get us into the last chapter part of the podcast, um, asking you a couple of rapid fire, but so not so rapid fire questions. Sure. Um, first question is the heaviest. <laughs> if, if you have the chance to work with a project, uh, run a project that's impacting every human being on earth, what project would you choose and why would you choose it? I would work on a project that would focus on high-speed internet across the globe. And why would I choose it? Because we, it would help in, number one, bridging, well, making internet free, high-speed internet free. That would be the project. <laughs> And that would eliminate a lot of what I consider digital inequalities. 
you know, because you, you, you know, there's many students do not have high speed internet or internet at home here in the U S they don't, they don't have it. They don't have access to it, Hmm. let alone other places in the world that would lead in my opinion to better connection, right? Especially an awareness, better connection with everyone, especially on social media, a lot of business done on social media, a lot of you know, information is transferred in that way. So I think we'd have a lot more access and exposure to different cultures, different markets and data, right? And information. Hmm. Uh, and, and that will also raise the level of many individuals and many people in different areas of the world to, to do business in different ways. Yeah, agree. Love that project. Next question is, where will you be in a year from now? I'll be in North Carolina <laughs> <laughs> at, at Methodist University. <laughs> what else is going on in, in, in your life in a year from now? Um, I'll still be working on, um, I have some more book projects that I'm working on, um, completing two other textbook projects that I'm working on. Mm. Um, with a, com- with a company called uh, Elevate You AI. Elevate You AI. So I'm releasing, I've got three projects I'm working with them and as well as some of my own uh, projects that I'm releasing. Interesting. That's an interesting question now, the next one for a professor. <laughs> how, how do you keep yourself up to date and informed on the topics you're interested in? Oh, that, that's good. Listening podcast, listening to to like your podcast, hearing different ideas, reading, going to conferences. I'm also I, I leverage being a professor. I reach out to companies and and, you know, magically I'm able to talk to a lot of people who are, you know, pro- pro- product managers and running different things. And they, and they reach out back and ask them questions and kind of get, kind of pick their brain. So just asking a lot of questions, um, staying focused. And I particularly what's helped me is because a lot of people say, oh, well, technology is very broad. I focus mainly on one area, if it's virtual reality and focusing on how that can impact uh, accounting. So yeah. it's kind of, kind of stay in one lane to make it uh, uh, easy. Yeah. If you have the possibility to shoot out and ask, which you will get now, um, to the innovators listening to this podcast, what would be your, your ask to, to, the, to the innovators? Yeah, send me an email. Send me an email. Um, I'm, I'm always open to have conversations, to talk, to help and and to to learn new things particularly to help so uh send, send me an email mokpon at methodist.edu you know I, and that, that would be my ask reach out to me i'm happy to to connect are there any other ways how how people can find you and reach out to you you can go to my website uh mfon my name.com mfonokpon.com you can reach me on my website um on social media on, on Instagram, mfon, uh, double underscore Akpan. You can reach me there as well. Uh, I'll uh, get back to you. Fastest way is my uh, either website. You can email me through the website or email me through the university. Yeah. Awesome. Mfon, it was a pleasure talking to you. It's very interesting. I'm looking forward to what's happening with technology in universities now more closer than before. <laughs> Thank awesome. you very much for your time. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to today's episode. You will find the links and resources in the show notes of this episode. If you would like to support the podcast, the most impactful thing you can do is subscribing to the show on any of the podcasting platforms and give me a review. This will help me to reach more innovators around the world and bring some of you into the show. If you have any question to the guest or want to engage with me, feel free to reach out to me on my public WhatsApp at plus four nine one five one 
7033-1176. I will repeat. Plus four nine one five one seven zero three three one one seven six. It's all WhatsApp texting only. Or follow me on social media and contact me there. And finally, if you look for someone educating you or your team on innovation culture coaching, have a look at heightlandinnovation.com. Thanks and see you in the next episode.